This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome. All right, today's uh, webinar, we're going to talk about commercial coverage parts. I call them coverage parts periodically, since your test goes a little crazy with that thesaurus. They call it modules. All right, so commercial coverage parts or co commercial coverage modulars. Um, buy one coverage, uh, one coverage part is a um, mono line policy. Uh, buying two or more would be a package or modular policy you might see on your exam. Okay. Um, so these are the different coverage parts that you can get uh, on your commercial package policy. Typically, we start off with property coverage. If you own a building, you definitely want coverage for it. Uh, instead of saying theft coverage in the business world, we call it crime coverage. Now, very similar to the theft associated with your home policy, except this is with a business. Uh, you have liability associated with your home or your dwelling, uh, and it's optional on the dwelling. It's also optional for a business, and it's called general liability. You might see it as general liability, GL, or CGL, commercial general liability. Instead of calling it floaters on the personal side, we call it inland marine coverage for business. For higher ticket items, you know, maybe you're a construction company, you have heavy machinery. That's kind of what we're talking about, mobile equipment. Uh, or even in a factory or, or warehouse where you're using forklifts. Now, these are vehicles that are typically not on the street, uh, not on the freeway, I should say, um, or high ticket, like theft of, I'm sorry, jewelry coverage, okay? Um, your commercial property policy covers jewelry up to a certain limit, but if you have higher value jewelry, then you might want to get in the marine coverage to increase the coverage on the jewelry that's being sold. But it can also cover customers' jewelry under your care, custody, and control. So uh, we'll go into that a little bit. Boiler machinery. We kind of want to view this like a home warranty. You know, when you buy a house, you buy that home warranty where if any of your appliances break down, you pay a deductible and someone comes out there to fix it. Um, kind of for a business, except for boiler machinery or, or sometimes you'll see it as equipment breakdown coverage. Um, most of your premium will go towards inspections to prevent loss. Auto, either we're in the automobile related industry, like a repair shop, uh, maybe a dealership, or we're using autos in the course of our business. Maybe you provide uh, company cars for your executives, or maybe you have a fleet of uh, trucks um, that you want to insure. And that's another thing we'll look at. And farm is kind of its own little package program. Uh, it is under the commercial category, but farm is a blend of residential and commercial on one program. Not only do you live there, you also work there. And so it does have both parts on one uh, program. Okay, so these are the modules. You do want to be familiar with it. Okay, we're going to start with commercial property coverage. So let's say you own a building. All right, and uh, if it's larger than a business owner policy, remember your business owner policy can cover a building up to six stories high, up to 100,000 square feet, and no more than three million in annual sales. So if it's larger than that, all right, uh, then you need to go to commercial property coverage. And that's what we're going to start off with. Um, in getting into the modules, you have to know the parts of a policy. Uh, you're going to see this on the personal line side and also on the commercial line side. Um, we have the D-I-C-E, DICE. Okay. Uh, declaration page, it's the first page of the policy. It basically tells you who the insurance company is, who is the insured, uh, beginning date, ending date of the policy, um, and kind of what type of policy it is. All right. And going along with what type of policy it is, that's kind of the insuring clause. It tells you the type or kind of policy. Usually it's part of the declaration page, okay, or it could be the second page. Right, but it's just, insuring clause just tells you what type of policy you bought. Conditions clause spells out the duties and rights of both parties. It basically says this is what you need to do in order to collect from this policy. That's how you want to understand it. Sometimes on your exam question, it'll be... Um, It'll state that it spells out the obligations of each party, basically what you're obligated to do in order to collect. And if a loss occurs, what the insurance company is obligated to do. Uh, and that's kind of the conditions clause. Right? You might see conditions agreement, just like insuring clause, you might see insuring agreement on the test. Right? So um, same thing. I mean, they just word it differently, just kind of throw you off. Exclusions are real simple. It's just going to tell you what the policy will not cover. 
Um, always think of catastrophic exposures typically not covered. Intentional acts and wear and tear are also typically not covered. Two other areas associated with that policy, you typically do have a definition section in the policy. Because yeah, we can look at earthquake or a flood um, and, and we can Google the definition and it'll give us a definition, but we want to look at the definitions that this policy um, has. Because even though there's a general definition, we have to look at how this policy defines this particular situation or item to know how the policy covers it or doesn't cover it. All right, so um, keep in mind with that. Um, and then we have endorsements. Now endorsements are optional, additional charge for additional features and benefits. Um, it helps you to personalize the policy to cater to your specific business. That's how you want to understand that. We have common policy conditions. Now, um, these are in each section, each coverage part of a commercial policy. So you do want to understand these conditions. Uh, the first one is cancellation, right? Who may cancel the policy? And you need to know that it's the first named insured. So if it's a partnership, uh, uh, Bill and Bob, you know, uh, maybe they have a hotel, um, who may cancel the policy? Well, if it's Bill and Bob's hotel, Bill is the first one named, so Bill has the, uh, uh, the ability to cancel the policy. They're the first named insured. Changes. Who can request changes to this policy? Again, first named insured. So going back to Bill and Bob's hotel, Bill is the first one named. Bill can cancel the policy. Bill can request changes to the policy. That's how you want to understand it. Examination of your books and records condition means the insurance company can examine your company's books and records during the policy period and for up to three years after coverage ends. Okay, so that's how you want to understand that. Um, statute of limitations in most cases ends in three years. Um, so, yeah, the insurance company must be able to go back in time to when the loss actually occurred and review whatever they need to to investigate a claim. Okay. All right. The next one is inspections and surveys. And when you see this um, in the policy, this is the, in, this is, how do you say it? Uh, for insurability is probably the best way to put that. All right. The insurance company may inspect or do surveys of your key employees to get an idea how your business operates. And this is to determine insurability. Do we want to insure this business? And then we go into what should we charge? All right. So inspections and surveys deal with insurability. It deals with underwriting the business, either at the time that we first write the business, or in some cases, we actually re-underwrite at renewal. Premiums, who's responsible for paying the premium? Again, that's the first named insured, okay? Um, so if the first named insured cancels the policy, the first named insured is entitled to the premium refund. Transfer of rights and duties um, are also called assignment. So transferring the rights or uh, the ownership of the policy from one party and to another is called an assignment. And so let's say you own a restaurant and you serve alcohol. Now for the test, if you serve alcohol, you cannot cover your restaurant under a business owner policy. But in the real world, we write restaurants using business owner policies, okay, just so you know. But for the exam world, if you're a, you're a fancy restaurant, you serve alcohol, you're going to go to the commercial package policy. All right. Well, let's say you've had this restaurant for a while, it's doing pretty good, and you decide you want to retire, so you're going to sell the restaurant. You know, rather than that person buying the restaurant from you, buy a brand new policy, right? You already have coverage on the restaurant. So in selling the restaurant, why don't you transfer the policy that you have on the restaurant to the person buying the restaurant from you? And that's called an assignment, transferring the ownership of the policy from one party to another. And you can do this, but you've got to have insurance companies permission, written permission, by the way. Because right? you've been running the restaurant for several years. You know, you know how the restaurant operates, how to run a safe operation. The person buying the restaurant from you doesn't have that experience. And with lack of experience, statistically, they typically suffer more losses. And so we can keep the same policy with the same coverages, but the insurance company may want to adjust the premium because there is a change in risk. Right? Um, and so that's what an assignment is. Uh, again, you can do an assignment transferring the ownership of the policy from one party to another with insurance companies written permission. Right. So get those components down. 
Some other items to keep in mind, named insured, is anyone named on the policy, right? So Bill and Bob's Hotel, they're both named. The first one named, like I said, is Bill. So Bill makes the decisions on the policy. All right. Um, officers, directors of the company are also covered as an insured. They may not be specifically named, but they're still covered by the policy. Right. It's kind of like your car. You know, um, you own a car, you lend a car to your friend. Uh, they don't live in your household, so they don't need to be named on your policy. Um, but, you know, they borrow your car occasionally. And should they get into an accident, um, they're still going to be covered. So you're the named insured on the policy, but they're still an insured even though they're not named. And that's kind of how you want to know the insured. In an insurance policy, we have the definitions of we or us, which is the insurance company or the insurer. We or us are going to protect you in the event that you suffer a loss. So our policy for property is to cover you and your stuff. All right, so you and yours would be the insured's property. Right? And then them or theirs would be for liability where you damage someone else's property or injure someone else. Right? So, And these are questions that they ask you on the exam. Like in a commercial property policy, the definition of we would relate to which of the following. Well, that would be the insurance company. Because we are going to protect you in case the loss occurs. That type of deal. Seems pretty simple, but I mean, some people, they do have some stress that builds up, uh, especially around taking tests. So um, through repetition, you'll pick up the material, pick up the information. Okay. But be thorough when you study my material. Don't think you can just do a little bit and say, I, I think I get it and go take the test. No, be thorough. Okay. In covering the material. Uh, with property policies, we do have cause of loss forms. If a peril is a cause of loss, a cause of loss form is a form that lists perils. And so the common ones you hear, uh, basic, broad, special. We have that with dwelling policies. We have that with homeowners policies. Right? Um, we do have that uh, kind of in a bop. We have a um, two different ways of putting that together. But um, for commercial property, basic, broad, special. And we're going to throw in another one, earthquake. So to be honest with you, in a commercial pro uh, property policy, you might have two cause of loss forms, like broad and earthquake. Okay, earthquake would be a name peril form because it covers losses such as earthquake. It's named. Okay, so now this does get a little different. In the purse line side, like a dwelling policy, a basic form only covers fire, lightning, and internal explosion. The standard fire policy covers fire, lightning, and removal. Very simple, and that's it. But for commercial, a basic form provides fire, lightning. You got your extended coverages called wharves, windstorm, hail, aircraft, riots, vehicle, explosion, and smoke. So it's a package of seven additional perils. Okay. Usually in a dwelling policy, a DP1 basic form, um, you, it's fire, lightning, internal explosion. For additional charge, then you can add the extended coverages, which is the seven perils. Uh, and if for more additional charge, you can add vandalism and malicious mischief. Right? Uh, but in commercial, the basic form actually covers those seven extended coverage perils along with vandalism. Uh, it also covers sprinkler leakage, sinkhole collapse, and volcanic action. Now, when I say volcanic action, I'm not talking volcanic eruption, you know, which causing tremors and, and sonic booms that damage your building. Um, I'm typically talking about a volcano erupts and dumps a bunch of ash. And that's, we need to clean up that, the ash that has spilled. That's kind of how you want to understand that, okay? Um, so the basic form does provide a little more coverage in the business world than it does in the purse lines world. The broad form covers those basic form perils, but also we're going to give you some glass coverage for the windows. Uh, the broad and special form, without any endorsements, gives you $100 a window with a $500 per occurrence max. Not a lot, Okay. Uh, but that's a limited glass coverage on the broad and special form, which we'll get into some other items that kind of increase that. The broad form covers falling ice. I'm sorry, falling objects. I'm jumping ahead. Uh, falling objects, weight of ice, sleet, or snow, and accidental discharge of water. Remember, accidental discharge. A lot of times for losses to be covered, you want to look for the phrase sudden and accidental. You got to be able to put a specific date and time to that loss of when it happened in order for it to be covered. Because if it's a slow leak behind the walls, mm, that's kind of like wear and tear, okay? Um, and that's typically not covered by insurance. 
the broad form and the special form also cover the loss of collapse, okay, from a covered peril. So um, broad form just covers more than the basic. So basic is a name peril form. Broad form is also a name peril form. The broad form just covers more perils than the basic form does. Next, we have a special form. And anytime you see special, open peril, or all risk, pay attention to exclusions. If it's not on the exclusion list, it's covered. So common exclusions would be earthquake and flood, and those you can buy back, right? You have the earthquake program, possibly in your state. Uh, there's a national flood insurance program where you can actually buy back that uh, flood loss coverage with a different policy. Right? Nuclear risk and war or active war will not be covered. They're catastrophic in nature. Um, nuclear risk can be purchased by larger businesses, but very expensive. Um, I think the U.S. government may provide it, and uh, I know there's some other private insurance companies, but it's extremely expensive because it's catastrophic in nature. War, act of war, also uh, typically excluded uh, because they're catastrophic in nature. Uh, wear and tear is not covered by insurance, and of course, intentional acts, definitely not covered by insurance. Right? So your business is going south. Um, you're not sure that you can recover in a drunken stupor. You light your business on fire. Um, that's not going to be covered. Okay. That's an intentional act. All right. I said the earthquake can actually be sold uh, as a cause of loss form added to your commercial property policy. Or you can actually, some companies offer it as an endorsement. So instead of a cause of loss form, they have an earthquake endorsement to add to your policy. Um, so those are two ways it could be added specifically to the policy. Um, or in some states, you have to just buy earthquake as a separate policy. Right. Um, if you didn't have earthquake loss, if an earthquake rumbled through and caused your building to collapse, that would not be covered. However, if earthquake caused an explosion like a gas line, um, which, you know, the earthquake caused friction in the gas line, causing it to, the pipe to break and spark at the break where it causes an explosion and ensuing fire. Um, the adjusters will come out. They'll determine what percentage of the loss was earthquake, what percentage of the loss was explosion, what percentage of the loss was fire, and then your insurance company will only pay for the fire and explosion portion unless you had the earthquake coverage. Right. And that's how you want to view that. All right. Valuation. Now, whenever you see valuation or valuation clause, it just means if a loss occurs, how will we cover the loss? Well, for commercial property, it's actual cash value. Right? That means what is the value to replace or restore, or rebuild this building minus depreciation. So we're giving you a used value. That's how you want to understand that. Now, on the personal line side, we typically have replacement costs for the home and an actual cash value for your personal belongings or contents. Uh, but for commercial property, actual cash value on the building, actual cash value on your contents, and actual cash value on other people's property under your care. That's how you want to understand that. All right. Most companies require you to carry a reasonable amount of coverage to the value of the building. And this is called co-insurance. Right? And for the test, they typically use 80%. I mean, it could be 70 to 90% in the real world. Um, I've seen 100% co-insurance. Um, but for the test, they typically will use 80%. And so, again, you got to understand the rationale of what coinsurance is about. Well, this first bullet here, like I said, it's to encourage insurance to carry a minimum amount of insurance in relationship to the value of the property. So you got to know this coinsurance equation because it's very common that it's on the test. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I keep it pretty simple. The amount of insurance you did have or did buy Excuse me, divided by what you should have had according to the insurance company. So did divided by should. <clears throat> you can typically simplify that part of the fraction. Multiply that times the loss. That's how much the insurance company will pay on your claim. Right? Minus any possible deductible. Uh, hold on, let me clear my throat here just a sec. <laughs> Okay, and so that's how much a company will pay, <clears throat> excuse me, on a claim, minus the deductible. Yeah. I got my bottle of water here, too. <clears throat> Let's still get that scratch. It doesn't go away. All right. <clears throat> now, if you carry adequate amounts of insurance to the value of the building, 
you get these five extensions for free, which we're going to discuss in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is crazy. All right. Um, <clears throat> so let's go into this coinsurance because a lot of people don't like math. <clears throat> and I don't care if you don't like math. Two to three math questions on your test. <clears throat> so you didn't fail because you didn't know math. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you can miss those three questions. It's still passed. But <clears throat> I want you to have a little confidence in understanding how this works. So what we're going to do, let's go into it. <clears throat> kind of a sample test question will look like this. There's an apartment house worth $500,000. <clears> the owner insures it for $300,000. The policy has an 80% coinsurance clause. And there's a $200,000 loss. How much will the insurer pay? And I don't know why that's a capital T there. That's funny. All right. So <clears throat> all you got to do is put the equation together. How much insurance you did have divided by what you should have times the loss equals the claim minus any possible deductible. Okay. So what you did have is you bought 300000 because that's the owner insures it for 300000 That's what you did have. What you should have is 80% of the value of the building, right, which is 400000 Okay, so since the question says there's an 80% coinsurance clause, that means the insurance company requires or says you should carry 80% of coverage to the value of the building. So if the building's worth 500000 you need 80% of that. That's the 400000 So if you put the value of the building right here, uh, you're going to get a wrong answer. Okay, because the, the insurance company says you only need 80%. All right, the loss is 200000 That's a given, uh, and there is no deductible. Okay, so you put none. All right, so you just plug it in, right? The amount of insurance you did have is 300 divided by what you should have had is 400. That simplifies to three fourths. Three fourths times the loss is the $150,000 answer. Okay, that's how you solve this equation or this math question on your test. And you may get this to maybe three questions max for math. Okay. Uh, these numbers typically look familiar to you. If you're registered with my material, um, you should see it in exam two, uh, question 118, A, B, C, and D. And I believe it's exam four um, at the beginning. I have this question with these numbers. So the numbers will look familiar when you take your test. Okay. All right. So coverage A is the building. All right, so the commercial property policy, right, uh, coverage A is the building itself. Uh, the insurance company wants you to have 80% of coverage to the value of the building. If you do cover, uh, provide, uh, if, you, uh, if you do have 80% of coverage to the value of the building, you get five extensions of coverage for free. Now, the difference between extension and endorsements is extensions are free. Endorsements are typically additional charge. All right. Um, and so let's say you bought a building and you're going to either buy the building next door or you're going to build a building next door. Okay, well, guess what? One of the extensions is we automatically give you $250,000 for that building next door that you either bought or are building. So, you know, when you have when you buy a new car, you have some time to notify the insurance company to add the new car onto the policy. Right? In the interim, you have coverage, right? Well, guess what? How about if you bought that new building? Uh, during the interim period, by adding it to the insurance, you still have $250,000 worth of coverage on it. Uh, we're also going to give you $100,000 worth of coverage for personal property in the new building. Okay. Uh, and those are two of the extensions. Um, where it gets a little different is for a business, your business personal property is only covered in and around the building within 100 feet of the premises. That means... If you're giving your uh, sales force computers and they take it take it away from the office and they go home and use it, you know, the laptops and stuff, um, it wouldn't be covered once they left 100 feet from the premises. And so one of the uh, extensions is we give you coverage for property off premises up to 10,000. OK, uh, you can buy more, but this is kind of a free portion of the policy. The sign uh, attached to the building will give you twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, if your sign is worth more than $2,500, then great. We can raise the value of, of coverage on that sign. Um, if the sign's not attached to the building, then you're looking at inland marine coverage, and that's sign coverage for that. 
Valuable papers and records, there is some limited coverage. I didn't put a number here because this part's not really important. Um, we're gonna get questions typically is uh, newly acquired and constructed property, okay? Um, business personal property and uh, property off premises. These are the three that they typically been asking, which of the following is an example of one of the extensions that may be added to a commercial property policy. All right, so these are the three you want to know. So coverage A covers the building, coverage B covers the business personal property or the contents coverage. That would be the desk, the computers, and everything else that's in the building, okay, uh, that you own, okay. Uh, personal property of others, um, I kind of put this as Bailey, so let's say it's a dry cleaning operation where you own the building, right, uh, you're covering your machinery and stuff that you have, which is your business personal property, but people leave their clothes with you to be cleaned. Um, and the building burns down, we're going to replace their clothes on an actual cash value basis. That's kind of covered C. That's how you want to understand it, just to keep it simple like that. Okay. There are different coverage forms. So not only do you get a commercial property policy, you might want to get some additional items or just buy these separately, to be honest with you. Builder's risk covers a building that's being built. That means anything that's being installed in the building, like girders, beams, cement, flooring, air conditioning units, that's going to be covered here. It doesn't cover the builder's tools because the contractor that you hired to build a building, they have coverage for their own tools. This actually would include theft coverage, which um, usually your commercial property policy does not cover theft at all, but builder's risk does cover theft of a building or part of a building during the course of construction. Okay, but like I said, it doesn't cover the builder's tools. There's no liability on this particular piece um, because everyone there on the property are builders and they're covered under workers' compensation. Um, if you are a revenue producing business, which you typically are, it was kind of redundant, but uh, if you did suffer loss where your building or business is shut down, uh, you can get business income coverage. Now, business income has a 72 hour deductible. That means if a loss occurs, you have to wait three days. Uh, if you're still not back in operation, then the insurance company will pay you lost business income or business revenue. Uh, you do need to know the business income formula, which is net income. Sometimes you'll see net profit or loss on the test before income taxes. All right? And keep in mind that your expenses include payroll. That means during a period of shutdown, you can still pay your employees so that when you open back up for business, they're still going to be around for you. Right. So remember, business income has a 72-hour deductible. Extra expense coverage, this provides money immediately at the time of a loss to get up and running as soon as possible. All right. So extra expenses begins immediately. Business income coverage has a 72-hour deductible. That's kind of how you want to know that. All right. um, and so let's say like a, you have a small newspaper factory. Uh, it's a daily newspaper and I'm still using newspapers because I still see them around. Um, <laughs> and there's a fire where you cannot print your newspapers, okay? Extra expense coverage gives you money immediately to get a location, get equipment, and get those newspapers printed and out on the street right away, okay? But if we can't get up and running very quickly, uh, then you might want to get the business income coverage to replace lost revenues because your newspaper is not producing at this time, okay? And so you can buy business income by itself, you can buy extra expense by itself, or you can buy them both, okay? Glass coverage, remember on the broad form, I said the glass coverage on a commercial property policy, broad form, is $100 a window with a $500 maximum. Well, there's more windows than five on the top floor of this one side of a building. And so $500, if they lost every window on that building, $100 a window with a $500 max, that's not enough if you own this building. And so by buying glass coverage, we can cover all the windows on an all risk basis. All right. to, show, to show you detail, every window is lettered and numbered and it shows exact position on the building and it's itemized on the information page, which is attached to the declaration page. Uh, that's detail, it's attached to the policy, okay? Uh, so glass coverage is gonna be all risk and it basically covers anything except fire. Uh, the reason your glass coverage doesn't cover fire is because your property policy covers fire losses. Okay, and that's what that's about. 
Condominium association coverage, this covers the exterior common grounds like the stairways, the hallways, the clubhouse. Condium, condominium unit owners coverage covers the interiors, okay? Um, and so usually if it's a brand new condo that's built, it'll have both. And if it does have both and you buying a brand new condo that just got built, not that it's new to you, it's a brand new condo building, okay, that you bought into. Uh, you actually only need an HO4, right? Um, which is a homeowner's design for renter because if this covers exteriors and interiors like kitchen cabinets and stuff, then an HO4 is all you would need if you bought that brand new condo. But eventually they're going to drop that unit owner's coverage where now you're responsible for the kitchen cabinets in the bathtub because you bought it, you own it. Then you got to move over to an HO6. That's that homeowner's policy that's designed for someone who owns a condo. Okay, so... But if your association has both, you can get an HO4. Uh, if it only has association, which most of them after a couple of years do, then you want an HO6. That's why one of the questions, which of the following may be used for someone who owns a condo, uh, HO4 and or HO6, okay? Leasehold interest, uh, let's say you have a fire. We're gonna put you at another location because uh, you cannot rebuild where you're at. Okay, well, great. Number one, you probably had to break a lease. That's what that's about. But also the new location, what if the new location that's comparable to the space you had has higher rents? Okay, this can cover that increased rents also. Okay. Um, legal liability just means we're going to cover what you're legally liable for. Right. So, but these are different coverage forms uh, that can be added to your commercial property policy. Commercial crime coverage. Yeah, people do steal. Okay. Unfortunately, it happens. Um, it's called theft coverage on the personal line side for a business. We're going to call it crime coverage. All right. So parts of the crime policy, right? Coverage A is employee dishonesty, which realistically is it's a fidelity bond. Whenever you hear fidelity bond on the test, it's an employee dishonesty type of coverage. Um, you as an employer, you want to buy coverage so that if your employee steals from you, uh, you terminate the employee, you file a claim to the insurance company, and the insurance company pays you so you, can, so you can go on about your business. Because if you didn't have that coverage your employee stole from you, you fire them. Then you're going to miss work because you have to deal with suing them to recover the property and the money that they stole from you. And so by buying a fidelity bond, well, if your employee steals, file a claim to the insurance company, right? you're going to terminate the employee. We pay you what you're legally entitled to, and then we, the insurance company, take over the claim and go after that dishonest ex-employee. So you don't miss a beat. You go on about building your business. Right? And so coverage A is actually a fidelity bond within the commercial crime program. Right? Uh, coverage B, is C, and D are for outside parties. So if an outside party got a hold of your checks and money orders, forged and altered them, and sent them out to their friends, um, that's what we're covering here. This is from outside parties because if your employee got a hold of your company checks and money orders and forged and altered them, that would be under coverage A. Your employee was dishonest. Coverage C is theft of money and securities from outside parties because if your employee stole from you, that's coverage A. Coverage D is they stole inventory from you property other than money and securities from outside parties. Because again, if your employees stole from you, then we're back over here. So coverage A is if basically if your employees do something dishonest, coverage B, C, and D is outside parties doing stuff. Okay. Um, some terminology, theft has the broadest definition. So you want to know that. Theft includes robbery. Theft includes safe burglary. Theft includes uh, robbery. Did I say robbery, burglary? Sorry, robbery, burglary, and safe burglary. Um, is our types of theft laws. Now, theft is defined as any act of stealing. Burglary is defined as damage to the entryway or exit way of a burglar as evidenced by visible marks of forcible entry. And so the example here, he's jimming this window, he's prying this open and damaging the window to break in. Um, that would be burglary. <clears throat> the stuff that he stole would be theft coverage. So if you didn't have both in a situation where he broke in, damaged it getting in, um, and so your stuff, uh, you'd come up short, okay? Uh, but in these two cases, there's really nobody there. Uh, but if someone is there and being threatened, that's the robbery, okay? So, but if there's no one there, it's either burglary or theft.
Right. Robbery is where someone's being threatened. Uh, they're threatening to injure or murder someone and take property from them. That's robbery. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me back it up here. Whoops. Let me back it up. Um, another thing you do want to understand is just on, on your commercial property, um, it covers losses in and around the building within 100 feet of the premises. And so for theft coverage, also, you want to keep that mindset. Um, you have on-premises coverage, which is in and around the building within 100 feet of the premises. So that would be if you give your employee the bank deposit uh, and they're still in the building, they're classified as a custodian, they have possession of company property on-premises. Okay. Uh, once they hop in their car and they drive to the bank, uh, their title now kind of changes from custodian to messenger. Messenger is someone who has company property away from the location of the business. Right? Now, a messenger could also be an armored car transport, right? but that's off-premises coverage. So if you, don't, if you only have on-premises, you don't have off-premises, and something happens as they're driving to the bank, then there wouldn't be coverage for that. Okay. So know, uh, know these definitions, theft, robbery, or theft, burglary, robbery, but also know custodian versus messenger. Okay. Two ways of writing commercial crime coverage, right? Um, if you go to my website, if you're registered, you will have access to that. I do have a cheat sheet there. I also have another pre-recorded webinar kind of explaining uh, the difference between loss, sustain, and discovery form. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that tonight here, okay? Commercial general liability is another coverage part, as you can see, it's like slip and falls. Uh, you might see commercial general liability, you might see CGL, right? They use acronyms. You might see general liability, or you might just see GL, okay? Uh, four ways of saying the same thing. So, uh, need to know the parts of a commercial general liability policy. Part A is bodily injury and property damage to others. That would be your customers. Your employees are covered under workers' comp. Okay, the owners of the company, well, they're they're an insured, right? So they're they're the first party. So liability covers third party claims, and so if they slip and fall, they should have health insurance. Right? So always think of for liabilities for your your customers. Right? So bodily and proper, uh, bodily injury and property damage to others. Uh, personal advertising injury. As a business, you might do some advertising and you might throw some comment out there that knocks your competition where they lose money because of it in some cases they could even close up if it's that bad and so they sue for you know your advertisement because it's got some false items in it that cause them to lose uh, money um, and so that would be covered under part b of your commercial general liability policy anytime you see medical payments think of an ambulance ride you know one of your customers slips and falls medical payments covers the ambulance ride uh, and then they're in a hospital racking up medical bills. That's the uh, bodily injury part. Okay. And then again, with all liability coverages, right, you also have supplementary payments. Uh, people don't realize this. When you're buying liability coverage from an insurance company, you're not just buying that, those limits of liability that you see on your declaration page. You're also buying the insurance company's legal defense team to possibly defend you in a case against you. And that comes out of supplementary payments. Okay, and the cost of defending you does not reduce your liability limits. All right, so if you have one million in liability, uh, someone suing you for eight hundred thousand for an incident, um, and the insurance company chooses to defend you, and it costs five hundred thousand to defend you, right, and they lose. That means not only did they have to pay the eight hundred thousand, right, for the lawsuit, they also had to cover the five hundred thousand legal defense costs. That's one point three million when you only had one million dollars worth of coverage. OK, um, but supplementary payments does not reduce your liability. It actually pays above and beyond your liability limits. And one of the little tricky test questions is if you have to miss work to help the insurance company um, defend a claim against your company, um, supplementary payments will pay you up to $100 a day for lost wages. And if that's not enough to indemnify you for missing income, your employer should make up the difference because in a sense we're defending them. OK. So that's where that comes into play. Two ways of writing commercial general liability, occurrence made and claims made coverage. Again, on my website, when you log in, um, under the playbook, you'll see a bunch of charts. Um, look for the uh, CGL and commercial crime 
uh, cheat sheet that I have there because it shows you how it works, uh, but also scroll farther down to the webinars and you can watch it and learn a little bit more about how these two types of coverages do work. Okay. So, all right. Inland Marine. Now, in the purse line side, um, we call them floaters. All right. Uh, additional coverage to increase uh, the value of high theft items. We're talking jewelry, we're sports cards, right? Silverware, firearms. Uh, your basic primary policy, like homeowners and dwelling, they have sublimits for high theft items. Like if someone breaks in, steals all your jewelry from your house, your policy gives you a maximum $1,500 for theft of jewelry. So if your jewelry is worth more than $1,500, either one item or multiple items, well, then you can get floaters to raise the value of coverage on your jewelry. So if something happens, it gets replaced at replacement cost. Right? And for a business, instead of calling them floaters, it's called Inland Marine. Now, even though you see the word marine or floaters, it has nothing to do with boats. All right? um, it's just old maritime law terminology that we just still use today. Okay, So it's giving you higher um, values for high theft items. Okay, So for like a jewelry store. Okay, I mean, there's some high ticket items. You have a commercial property policy covering the store, uh, covering the displays and some of the smaller pieces of jewelry. Um, but then you get Inland Marine to cover the higher ticket items. Okay, uh, Inland Marine is all risk coverage. That means pay attention exclusions. Okay, it's worldwide coverage. So your floaters, just like Inland Marine, cover your personal property or business personal property anywhere in the world. Okay? And it provides coverage on a replacement cost basis. So remember your commercial property policy paid actual cash value for the building, actual cash value for your contents, and actual cash value for other people's property under your care, custody, and control. And Inland Marine changes that actual cash value to replacement cost coverage for other people's property. And that's how you want to know it. On the personal line side, you have scheduled and unscheduled. Scheduled means we need an itemized list. Unscheduled means we don't need a list, but you do have to prove that you had it in order to collect. Okay. Uh, for commercial, they use filed or non-filed. Um, I really haven't seen this on the test. They still say scheduled and unscheduled. Anytime you see scheduled, it means I need an itemized list with appraised values. Okay. That's kind of how you want to uh, just keep it simple for that. Okay. Boiler and machinery. This is kind of like that home warranty. Right? When you buy a house, you get the home warranty. A dishwasher breaks down or a washing machine breaks down. You pay someone a deductible, they come out and fix it. Um, this is kind of what boiler machinery is for a business. Uh, typically, you might see it as equipment breakdown coverage. Okay, um, It's written as all risk. So again, your commercial property coverage gives you actual cash value for the building, actual cash value for contents, but the equipment breakdown portion gives you all risk coverage. Okay. Um, that means pay attention to exclusions and it's replacement costs. We price it brand new. Uh, the exclusions associated with equipment breakdown is wear and tear. Like I said, wear and tear is never covered. Your test may not say wear and tear. Um, they go crazy with the thesaurus and what they'll probably say is inherent defect. Tools have a tendency to break down and need to be replaced. This is an example of which of the following. It's an inherent defect. That's the test way of saying wear and tear. Okay, so, um, and that's what that's about. Uh, when you pay premium, most of your premium goes towards inspections to help prevent loss. Okay, so by doing routine inspections, maybe we can detect um, something wrong with it, replace out some worn out fittings to keep from a loss occurring. Um, so it's kind of a proactive approach, okay? Uh, commercial auto coverage, again, either you're in the automobile related business or you do have commercial vehicles that uh, you use in the course of the business. Uh, parts of the policy, just like your purse lines, you have your liability, which is bodily injury, property damage. You have medical, right, uh, for you and your passengers, uninsured motors, in case you get hit by someone without insurance, and you have the physical damage coverage. Now, the reason I have medical and uninsured motors in red is because these are optional. So in your personal auto policy, liability, medical, uninsured motorists are kind of built in. 
Uh, your clients can say, I don't need medical or I don't need uninsured motorists, and they can sign off that they don't want it. But in commercial, it's only bodily injury property damage. This is optional because honestly, these are company vehicles. And if your, your employees drive to work and then they hop in a company car to go do their thing and bring it back and then hop back in their car to go home, they're only using these vehicles during work. That means they're covered under workers' comp, and that's therefore these are not necessary. Okay, but that's why they're optional. Um, coverage D is physical damage, right? Just like collision and other than collision on the purse line side, but it's called collision and comprehensive for business. Okay, now um, I'm going to throw in one more, which for some reason I thought is down here. Um, the physical damage portion of a commercial auto policy has three parts collision which is colliding with a vehicle or object in the road or upset. Comprehensive, which is from losses other than collision or upset. Um, and so the collision is you hit something, it's your fault. Comprehensive, something hits you, it's not your fault. You know, it damages your car. But there's also a third one called specified cause of loss. Okay. Uh, so it's a very limited, it's a named peril physical damage coverage for your commercial vehicles. Okay, so and you can blend it. You can get collision and comp. Uh, you can get collision only, get comp only. Uh, collision and specified cause of loss. You can get specified cause of loss only. Okay, uh, truly inexpensive for the most part. Very limited. I think it's like seven perils is all it covers. Okay. Um, commercial auto versus business auto. Commercial auto, we're using them in the business. Business auto is like we're a repair shop. Okay. Um, and then you might want to consider getting garage keepers coverage. Garage keepers coverage is the only commercial auto coverage that provides coverage for you driving a customer's vehicle, like a test drive, and you have, and you have a collision claim. All right. Um, another area where garage keepers coverage would be needed would be like a valet, all right, parking garage, where you're parking customers' vehicles and there's a collision claim. All, right. all your other uh, commercial auto policies don't cover that. All right. In the commercial auto world, we have symbols. Right? I know they look like numbers, but we call them symbols. Um, and the ones you're going to get typically are these. I mean, there's like 60 some symbols, folks. Right? You only need to know these. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. Start at the bottom. Non-owned autos. This is where employees use their own car in the course of the business. So symbol nine. Nine begins with an N. N for nine. N for non-owned. Okay. Uh, eight would be a hired auto. Um, and so let's say uh, you have uh, vehicles used in your business. Uh, one of them breaks down to where you have to rent a car, okay, uh, to do work. Um, that would be a hired auto. Uh, rental cars used in the business. Seven is specifically described autos that the company owns. S for seven, S for specifically described auto. This is probably the most common commercial auto question. Someone has a commercial auto policy with this vehicle is listed as symbol number seven. And this means which of the following. S for seven, S for specifically described autos. Uh, five are states that have no fault. So F for five, F for fault, right? Look for that. Uh, but four also begins with an F, but I joke around and say, you know, faux owned autos. I'll drag out the four and faux owned autos other than private passenger autos, okay? Um, and then one, this is the first number of the numeric system. A is the first letter of the alphabet. So symbol one covers any auto. So if you're the owner of the business and you're classified with symbol one, it actually basically this policy covers you driving any vehicle, your vehicle, a rental car, um, company car, your personal car, um, unless you stole it. Okay. Uh, but this covers you. So it's pretty comprehensive. Motor carrier coverage. So, in each state, there's minimum liability limits that you're required to have. Um, for business, trucking, um, their minimums are definitely higher. I mean, just a moving company has to carry a minimum $750,000 worth of liability. Okay. Uh, the middle one, I doubt you'll get on the test. But if you're transporting explosives, you need to carry a minimum $5 million of liability coverage. And this is just like purse lines. These are the minimums. You can always buy more. Uh, in most cases, it's recommended you buy more, okay? Um, and so these are the minimum liability on shipments. But the test will say if someone has a, you know, a moving company, what's the minimum liability that they must carry according to the Motor Carrier Act? Um, 750000 okay? But if they're transporting explosives, look for $5 million.
Okay. All right. The last item is farm coverage. Remember, farms are a blend of residential and commercial. Uh, not only do you live there, right? Uh, you also work there. Okay, so it's kind of a blend of personal and commercial on one program. Um, the farm property coverage covers your house, other private structures, your personal belongings, but also includes loss of use, just like your home policy. Okay, but it also covers the farm. So it covers structures on the premises for farm use. Okay, um, can ever, it can also cover equipment. Um, scheduled or unscheduled equipment, like farm equipment, right? Like the tractor, that would be farm equipment. Um, but Farmer John's pickup truck that he drives to the store would actually be a personal auto. So it wouldn't be a farm, uh, part of the farm coverage. So if it's a vehicle with a license plate, um, it's covered under auto coverage, not farm. Okay. So um, there's also the liability section covers bodily injury and property damage to others. Uh, again, as a farm, if you're, you know, marketing your business, you might advertise. And so there's personal advertising injury and also medical payments. Remember, this is an ambulance ride for guests on your property that are injured. Okay. And then they come after you for liability to pay for the injury of their medical bills and lost wages from being in the hospital. Okay. So that's kind of what that is. Uh, anyone have any questions? All right. Hi, Lauren. Hi, how you doing? Good. Um, I don't know for boiler and machinery. Uh huh. Like, like how long uh, uh for the replacement cost? What do you mean? How long for replacement cost? Like, if we break downs, I mean, there's uh. It's, like, okay, it's, so I, I understand. I kind of understand. Of course. So what you have to view as if a loss occurs, if it's a covered loss, um, you know, like explosion of steam pipe, steam turbines that cause losses, um, it's an all risk coverage and it will pay replacement costs to rebuild the machinery. Okay. Uh, and that's how you want to view that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. It's a uh, it's it's actual cash value, all right? All the no, no replacement cost. Boiler replacement. machinery is replacement cost. Replacement cost, okay. Yeah, commercial property is actual cash value. Um, inland marine and boiler and machinery are replacement cost. Okay. You got it. Yeah. All right. Uh, also, for the H O four and H O six, yes, under under the, on the, on the condominium association coverage, yep. how how it works? Like I know H O six is for the owner. Yes. So, um, actually, H O four or H O six could be used for someone who owns a condo, and that will depend on your condominium association policy. So if the condominium association policy covers uh, the association coverage and the unit owner's coverage, then you only need an HO4 if you own a condo because the association unit owner's coverage covers your kitchen cabinets and your bathtub. Okay. okay. But if your condominium association only covers the exterior, the uh, common grounds, then you want to get an HO6 because you own the kitchen cabinets and, and bathtub and features and so now you need coverage for that in case something happens okay for if for exterior ground co coverage yeah external exterior grounds common areas like the hallways the stairways right maybe mm -hmm. the clubhouse that's the exterior that's a, a condominium association exterior coverage okay it's that's how you want to do that yep H O six for units. Uh, for H H O four is for the renters, right? And personal. Well, okay. So usually we think of H O four is for renters, but a condo owner could actually mm -hmm. use an H O four if the association has exterior and interior coverage. Okay. Interior. Okay. Okay. Coverage. I know that one's a tricky one, huh? Yes. Yeah, because we and associate also on, renters, also yeah. and, and the test that I took, and I have uh, HO8 also. 
808 is for antique homes. Antique home, yes. Yeah, it's a modified HO1, which is limited recovery and only pays actual cash value for antique homes. That's your thought, okay. That's yeah. So if an antique home burns down, we can rebuild it to look just like it did before the fire, but it's it's not an antique anymore. That's why we pay actual cash value on that. Yes. Okay. Even theft has a sublimit of $1,000 per occurrence. That's it. Okay. When do you plan on taking your test again? Uh, by next week. Okay. Good, good, good. Yes. Uh, one last quite, uh, question about uh, the builder's risk coverage. Is, it's, uh, is, is it all risk for theft also? Uh, yes, it is, but only theft from uh, property on premises. So in and around that building that they're building and within 100 feet of the building. Uh, that's all we covered for. Okay. okay. But oh, you're looking at theft of the building or part of the building. That's the theft coverage you're looking for. Okay. So let's say we put like three, we, we, we finished three stories of an eight story building and someone rips out all of the copper wiring in it. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of the theft coverage you're looking at. Okay. 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 Build on this. Okay. Um, for uh, for custodian and and versus um. Uh, Messenger? Messenger, yes. Yes. The custodian is for someone that was hired by the business owner. Not necessarily. I mean, you're just you. Your possession of company property on premises. That's okay. a custodian. But okay. it doesn't have to be an 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 employer. Don't read too much into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Just know kind of kind of the classification. If you're in possession of company property on premises, you're called a custodian. If you're a pos in possession of company property away from the location of the business, you're classified as a messenger. Yeah, you're away from okay. business. Yeah. That helps out. Uh, yeah, as as far you said for now commercial auto, mm -hmm. it's uh you said uh part B, it's uh it's optional. Yeah. So if 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 your employee drives to work, and they leave their car in the company parking lot, and then they hop in a company car to go to wherever their the work site is that they're working, um, that's a workers' comp claim. So you don't need medical because workers' compensation provides medical for them when they're engaging in activities for wage or profit, or how we typically say, if they're injured on the job. Okay, so if they're driving from the office, from the, the work site where they picked up the company car and they're driving to a site that they're working at and they get into an auto accident, if they get hit by someone without insurance, they're still yeah. covered under workers' compensation. Workers' compensation, okay. Yeah. So medical income, death and rehabilitation benefits while injured on the job. So medical and uninsured motors are not really needed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's optional. About for um, garage keepers, mm -hmm. you said that cover uh, for P, like for auto and commercial that keep the customer customer vehicle. Well, you're, yeah, you're driving, not that you keep the customer's vehicle, uh, you drive the customer's vehicle. So you know how valet parking, right? Yes. Where you go to a restaurant, someone hops in your car and they drive to a parking spot. What if they have a collision claim? They're responsible, right? Yes. And so garage, garage keepers coverage covers a collision claim. Okay. From the business using the customer's vehicle. So a parking lot, parking structure, a repair shop that does test drives. That's the coverage they're going to need. 
Oh, we pair shop. Okay. Yeah, it's the only coverage that covers a collision claim while using a customer's vehicle. How about the dealership? A dealership, they're not typically driving customers' vehicles. The customers are driving the dealership's cars on a test drive. And so the dealership has liability coverage and physical damage for the cars that they own and that, are, that they're selling. Okay, so always remember, garage keepers is if you are driving other people's vehicles okay as your business all right as far for uh part c of the commercial auto policy which is uh on uninsured, uninsured motorist or under yeah. insured motorist does, yeah does that cover like uh the physical or or, or medical uh what's, it covers cover medical for the insured? it covers medical uh, so it'd be for the insured if they're injured because they got hit by someone who doesn't have insurance or doesn't have enough. So it's bodily injury. It doesn't cover damage for the company vehicle. Um, you'd have to get uninsured motorist property damage, or it could be under um, uh, what well, we call it a deductible waiver if you have the collision coverage. Um, we'll chalk it up to a no-fault collision, and the deductible waiver waives your collision deductible for that incident. Okay. Okay. About for the personal auto, the, the uninsured cover. Which only part? people, only the only, people, only the people yep. like, like for, for like for medical. Yep. Or, and lost wages. Lost wages. Yep. But it doesn't cover the, 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 like for instance, for repair. No, not the vehicle. Uh, you need to get UMPD, Uninsured Motorist Property Damage Coverage, to cover damage to your car if you got hit by someone without insurance. Oh, because, uh, yeah, I remember I have um, a question of, of that, too. Yeah. About, uh, it, they, asked me, they asked me what does uh, the UM cover and then uh, personal auto. Mm -hmm. And it pays like $3,500 to fix your car. That's about it. Oh, to, that's meaning to fix the car, but that's meaning it cover also the, the vehicle too, right? Uh, well, that's, well, again, so if someone without insurance hits you, yes, the uninsured motorist and underinsured motors covers you and your family that are injured because of the accident, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And then UMPD, because remember, if they hit you and they don't have insurance, your UMPD could cover the cost to fix your car up to a certain amount. Um, if, it's, oh. if you just have, if you if you don't have collision coverage, it pays thirty five hundred dollars to fix your car. If you have collision coverage, then the UMPD becomes a deductible waiver, and it'll just waive your collision deductible. And it, like I said, we use the collision part of your policy uh, with the deductible waived. That's that's UMPD. Yeah, UMPD. Cover the uh, the uninsured motorist property damage. Yeah, it covers damage to your vehicle because someone else hit it who does not have insurance. Oh, okay. So it's their but, fault. Yes, but yeah. for personal, the UM only cover you and your family. Yeah, and, and even in commercial, UM and UIM only covers you and your passengers in your car. That's it. Yeah, for yeah. for medical only. Yeah, and lost coverage. Yep, lost wages. You got it. Lost wages, yeah. sorry. Lost wages. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on the right path. <laughs> yeah, it's very tricky. I'm <laughs> it is, especially if you're not used to dealing with it, you know? Yes. All right. Any additional questions here? As far for claims mid form and occurrence made? And occurrence made, yes. Yep. Those those were on the test also. Yeah, and those if you're registered with my program, um, I do have additional information to help define that on my mm -hmm. website. So not only do I have a sheet that helps you understand it, um, but there's also a recorded webinar that you can access, which explains how it works for commercial general liability, but also commercial crime. You know, you have the law sustained and discovery form. Those are two ways of writing commercial crime coverage. Okay. Okay. So when you're logged into my site, uh, again, scroll down to the bottom uh, and you'll see the different webinar links and just click on it and you can watch it and learn more. So which one that will be covered uh, mostly the, for this exam? Um, what do you mean? The, the part of the, the package. 
which one's going to be the biggest part of your exam? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't answer that. It's pretty random. I would say the property and the commercial general liability are, are the biggest areas that they do um, ask questions on as far as the commercial section um, on those parts. I mean, they do ask you a little bit of inland marine, you know, commercial crime, boiler machinery, farm, uh, commercial auto. You want to know it all. Uh, but I think a majority of the questions are in the commercial property, commercial general liability. Um, but also in the commercial section, you got to consider business owner policies. Um, you also have to consider bonds. Okay, so bonds are also typically used in business also. Um, and ocean marine coverage. So there's there's other areas of commercial coverage uh, that it, we didn't quite touch on in this particular webinar. I just wanted to get the more of the commercial package uh, program first. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. You got it. All right. Okay. And then I'll post uh, next week's schedule pretty soon. I'll probably, um, um, well, later on tonight, what I'll do is I'll set up, I've got to think of what I want to cover, and then I'll set the links on my website for next week. So, okay. so every Thursday, right? Um, it varies. Um, I'll probably keep it for Thursday for a couple weeks, but then I might switch it over to a Wednesday. Um, but Wednesdays, I have securities training that I'm teaching um, a team of people down in Southern California. Um, and so I kind of, I'll, I'll rotate around, but I'll, I'll try and put like two to three weeks, um, uh, scheduling, uh, up, uh, tonight, uh, just right. so you have a, more of a heads up farther what's coming down the pipeline versus this is all I have for this week. And I don't have anything for next week yet. So I'm trying to get more, um, I guess post more out there. So, so you know what's coming. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Ryan, for oh, the you time. got it. Hey, thanks for uh, engaging and asking questions. You know, I'm always here to help people. So it, it's, yeah, it's, it's good to, uh, you know, to be a resource to help you out and hopefully you pass your test on the next attempt. And uh, again, any questions that come up between now and then reach out. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You got it. All right. All right. I just want to pitch this out. If anyone wants to learn more, I mean, go to lgdstudy.com. You can register right away and access sample test questions. Um, uh, I've got a play, a vir it's an online playbook, which is kind of like a virtual flashcard set to help you out. Um, and definitely there's a lot more webinars to teach you more of the material. So uh, with that, thank oh, you should, for hanging out. Oh, so okay. which one for the for the uh, questions? Which one is that? Okay. Because oh, you want to like, go to... Because you're doing property casualty, so you want to go to lgdstudy.com to register. This is for registrations. Um, and you want to go down to the property, fire, and casualty exam prep. That's the one oh, you want. Property, fire, and exam prep. Okay. Because it. it's property and casualty or fire and casualty. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interchangeable. So, And that's the one you'd want to access the material. So this one, what's the uh, – it's uh... – so we have all the uh, webinars. Uh, well, we I've got a lot of other stuff on my on my website. I have enough well, to teach you everything you need to know to pass the test. Yeah, but I'm looking for the the one that I really need, the property, fire, oh, and casualty. property, fire, and casualty. You got it. That's the prep I need. That's it. All right. Um, okay. All right. So I will, I, will, I will look into it. So okay. there's no special going on right now for this one? Uh, no, not right now, but I'm going to probably raise rates by the end of the year. So, uh, you got some time, don't worry, no pressure. Um, but yeah, if you want to get started and get the material to pass the test, um, my material works in all States and it, it's it, for the feedback. If you watch the, look at the comments on the YouTube, I mean, it, it's very yeah. good stuff. So I'm, 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 saw, I'm blessed. That, that, I'm that, proud. That's yeah. That's so. why I saw the comments on YouTube. That's why I contact you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes. And every week I have a webinar you can just access anytime. Okay. Um, um, if you want to hop in, just look at the upcoming training link and just hop onto the webinar to learn more each week. And those I'd leave open. Right now, those are free. So, okay. Yes. Um, the webinar is free, right? You got it. So once you yes. register, you'll have access to more information. Um, you register at uh, LGD Study and it'll give you access to LGD Consulting where all the material is at. Okay. All right. Um, you'll get an email reply with your login information and instructions on how to study. It's okay. for how long? The, the uh, 60 days. Plenty of time. You only need two to three weeks. Honestly. Okay. Okay. okay.
Thank yeah. you. Oh. But again, it's it's not a rush. Go at your own pace. And um, if you do have questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your help. Tonight. You got it. Yeah, nice Pleasure. chatting with you. All right. Pleasure. <laughs> All right. Good luck. You take care. Yes, sir. All right.